So um, maybe we could start off then. And uh, you mentioned chat GPT. So does that mean that your beliefs about the um, binding problem and, and uh, Turing computers as um, micro experiential zombies have changed? Or do you still hold those same beliefs as you did a year ago? but uh, are, are able to incorporate everything chat GPT does into that former belief. So <laughs> where do things stand? Yes, uh, although like so many people, I am very impressed by chat GPT. No, my views haven't changed. Uh, I think classical Turing machines are zombies or technically micro experiential zombies. They have the wrong sort of architecture to support subjects of experience, normally bound subjects of experience, uh, that chat GPT doesn't uh, prefigure artificial general intelligence that as chat GPT will tell you itself, it is a zombie. It is, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, no experiences whatsoever. In other words, classical digital computers and classical connectionist systems are ignorant of the entirety of the empirical evidence. And by empirical, I mean relating to experience. Um, yeah. And yeah. yeah, I mean, as, 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 as we know, uh, biologists, evolutionary biologists disagree what consciousness is for. And if instead of asking what is consciousness for, ask what phenomenal binding is for. Uh, and the best way to see just how powerful phenomenal binding is, is to look at these syndromes, neurological syndromes, where binding partially breaks down. We've touched on this before. Integrative agnosia, where you could see a tooth and a mane and a mouth, but not a lion. Or simultaneous agnosia, where someone can only see one object at once. Or akinetopsia or motion blindness. Basically, binding allows minds, uh, minds that are capable of supporting both local binding, i.e. individual perceptual objects, and global binding, the unity of the self and the unity of perception. Um, and humans can talk at length about our phenomenally bound experiences, the nature of consciousness. We can solve the binding problem. We can discuss the varieties of qualia or subjective experiences. Uh, phenomenally bound consciousness has the causal functional capacity to discuss itself as I'm doing now. And none of this uh, is possible for a micro experiential zombie. Um, but what are the upper bounds of zombie intelligence? And the honest answer is, I don't know. Um, and in theory, one can envisage, you know, some kind of gigantic lookup table, much <laughs> larger right. than the accessible universe that could right. spit out answers indistinguishable from what I'm doing now. But right. yeah, back in the real world, ChatGPT, it is a fascinating tool and its successor, future iterations are going to be better. But nonetheless, uh, its ignorance is architecturally hardwired. And this isn't going to change that no that running uh, the software uh, more, more quickly, you know, greater speed of execution, um, more sophisticated code and so on, it's not going to wake up. Um, right. Now, yeah. Yeah. Even, even, if, even if you think, well, it's not going to wake up, if you, if you acknowledge that on pain of strong emergence, it's not going to wake up, you may take the view that, I mean, something like chess, for example, it is... Functionally, computationally relevant, whether your computer chess program uh, is a subject of experience, that yes, a grandmaster can see a board differently from a novice, but your computer chess software doesn't need to see a, bo uh, uh, to see a board. It can simply outperform humans. But there right. are a vast range of cognitive tasks that a classical Turing machine is simply incapable of, not least anything relating to... Yeah, the, the, the nature varieties of uh, phenomenally bound conscious experience, um, because all each of us ever knows 
directly is the contents the contents of consciousness our own minds and a classical turing machine is ignorant by its very nature of of, of these contents yeah well but isn't it surprising how useful predicting what would come after a phrase that you might input turns out to be i mean one would have said in previous years Wow, that, that's a ridiculous approach. You can't just ask it what would come next. But it turns out that <laughs> simply asking a computer what comes next can create answers that in every way are better than the person putting in the prompt could ever create themselves. You know, they, they can be more accurate, uh, higher level of intellectual activity, seemingly demonstrated, better writing, better drawing, everything better. So, and I, I find that really surprising and it's going to get better. I mean, as Sam Altman says, um, chat GPT is basically broken. You know, it, you shouldn't count on it for anything. Right, but, <laughs> but GPT-4 is coming, which will be much better, uh -huh. more accurate, faster, you know, better in every way. Yeah, so so anyway, we and, and so as you know, what I've posited, and I hope the students find it's exciting, is this 60 day period between January 3rd and March 2nd, I think a lot of exciting stuff is going to happen in the AI world. And I mean, one of the things is the fact that chat GPT can pass the medical licensing exam, the US medical licensing exam. Doesn't pass it easily, doesn't get the highest grade ever, but it does pass all three components. So. <laughs> It, in theory, could practice medicine. Don't you find that surprising? Or do you actually think, uh, you know, physicians are pretty dull and so it <laughs> doesn't surprise you at all? Well, uh, it, periodically one gets these cases. I was reading one the other day of someone with absolutely zero qualifications and apparently been practicing medicine for 20 years. Um, right. Uh, without wishing to be uncomplimentary about physicians, <laughs> no, that doesn't totally surprise me. I mean, yeah, I like as I said, I have actually this year been happily rather than writing, actually sit, checking out the limitations of Chat GPT, finding out what it knows about. Yeah, it, inevitably one tends to be a bit self-referential. What does it know about the hedonistic imperative? Sure. Try work. What does it know about tra transhumanism? Um, yeah, whereas until now it's been trained on relatively, I was going to say respectable sources, you know, Wikipedia <laughs> and so on, presumably as more and more people are, yeah, putting in the public, public domain stuff churned out by these digital zombies, increasingly it's going to be uh, trained on junk it has itself produced and all, one suspects that all manner of Actors, for purposes of their own, are trying to train and trick GPT. I mean, I click like to answers I approve of and dislike to answers I disapprove of. Um, I try to phrase my prompts in such ways as to get interesting answers. I'm sure all kinds of actors, organizations, people, probably state, uh, state uh, state run organizations too are trying to bias the responses and i presume yeah uh, yeah. yeah countermeasures are, countermeasures in, are in place too but because even though right now we're in the you know exponential growth phase i think it is going to plateau plateau to, to, to plateau out precisely when i i i i can't say but right. um i mean it's partly it's a matter of one's preoccupations and that if like me you're fascinated by the nature of consciousness different state spaces of consciousness um then i think you're going to be less impressed than uh, uh shall we say someone who is you know whether it's sort of mathematics or physics or 
or something like that. Um, yeah, yeah. So, like, so if, let, I said, interested, yeah. Let's uh, shift gears a little bit and celebrate the fact that you and I critiqued Stuart Russell's lectures from December 2021. We, we did that about a year ago in, in January 20th, 2022. And about a year later, Stuart Russell was talking to the Nobel Committee Dialogues, uh, that program, and gave a remarkably positive view of, of the future that seems completely different from what he was talking about in those lectures in December 2021. So it looks like we influenced him, but maybe that's impossible. He, he's the author of the most famous AI um, textbook, very well-known person. Um, so what, what do you think, David? Do you think we did something fantastic or we did nothing a year ago? You well, think I have a... <laughs> It strikes me as extremely which, which, which do you back? I I incline to think that one has most influence uh, on the on the young. Uh, someone who I won't embarrass uh, by mentioning his name at the age of twelve, for example, had had appendicitis and was given morphine for his appendicitis, and then. Uh, stumbled across opioids.com and then insisted on telling uh, the rest of the world about how this <laughs> site was remarkable and that how she should, yeah, essentially, I don't go with the uh, Jesuit idea that, yeah, the first five, if you get a kid for five years, you get the kid kid for life. But yes, one has most influence if, if one is reaching people in their teens and early 20s whereas uh so yeah, you're, older you're people saying get a kind of that Stuart of the russell is too old to be influenced by anyone or well by when us? was the last time that you you radically shifted your views in response to anything right I, but I, he uh, seems to have done that we don't know it's in response to us so another possibility is Rich Sutton, who is the AI scientist here that I, I work with fairly closely and a good friend of mine. He is, in a sense, better known or more academically um, uh, strong than uh, Stuart Russell. And it's possible that somehow we stimulated Stuart Russell to get interested in uh, Rich Sutton's ideas, which include this idea of the eye on the prize and uh, this very positive outlook on what artificial general intelligence could possibly do when working on behalf of uh, the human race. So anyway, we, we, we don't know exactly what, what happened, but the practical side of it is, think of pushing any idea when you're the only person espousing it or where the only other person who is in favor of it lives in the same city. So that's the situation that Rich Sutton and I were in before Stuart Russell's uh, latest uh, presentation. And now it, it looks like the three of us are singing from the same songbook, you know, at, at, at least in terms of the general features. <laughs> but I have a feeling that David Pierce doesn't agree with any of the three of us, right? What do you think? How positive could artificial general intelligence be? What does David Pierce think about that question? Well, as I said, in what sense have you got general intelligence if you have a zombie that is incapable of accessing the empirical evidence? The empirical evidence uh, being uh, consciousness in all its teeming varieties. Um, that 
I suppose I find myself being cast in the role of naysayer, whereas in practice I'm as excited <laughs> as almost anyone else at this at this wonderful tool, and I'm happily, you know, playing around for several hours a day, finding up prompts for it to reply to. But nonetheless, uh, general intelligence, it's got to be able to explore the empirical evidence, the nature uh, of consciousness, hard problem, binding problem, the palette problem. Um, as long as you have a system that is incapable of exploring the intrinsic properties of matter and energy you haven't got general intelligence i mean could you have his you know uh, as an example could you have a general intelligence that didn't understand the second law of thermodynamics i mean one would say nonsense um sure. but uh yeah uh, either you think that the account that some of us give of the nature of binding is wrong and that sooner or later one of these classical turing machines Connectionist systems is going to wake up, become a phenomenally bound subject of experience and starting to explore the state spaces of consciousness, or you just accept that a, a, a zombie is a zombie. Yeah. Um, right. So um, uh, maybe, I, I think you actually enjoy interacting with our students and maybe they could ask you some questions of course, they include possible questions, include very exciting things David and I haven't yet talked about this time. For instance, what would a world be like if women were in charge of everything? Or what would a world be like if we abolish suffering and only have a range of sort of positive, pleasurable experiences? And, and if no, not only no humans suffer, but no animals suffer and no living beings suffer. You can kind of decide where you want. So, so those are all things that David Pierce is, is a kind of thought leader in. So would, would one of you like to um, turn on your video and maybe ask him a question? <laughs> Why? You brave enough to do that? He's a fairly benign person. He, he doesn't harm anything, so he probably won't harm you. By, by way of context, anyone? Uh, yeah. Why all female leadership? Uh, essentially, I would argue it's the best way to avoid catastrophic nuclear war this century. Which, when I was uh, arguing this a few years ago, probably seemed remote. But as we know from the conflict in the Ukraine. Uh, yeah, I sure. suspect uh, Mr. Putin would, uh, would, would take the world down with him, not, yeah. not you know, uh, essentially rather than even lose face. One suspects that various leaders would actually initiate uh, Armageddon, and it's going to happen right. sooner or later unless we take yeah. uh, steps. Now, one route would be world government, um, but most effective of all in practice, I would say most, well, it's not really realistic, would be all female leadership, not, I'm not saying this out of feminism, though I tend to describe myself as pro-feminist, but as a purely technical measure, it would probably work. Uh, I don't in practice spend much of my life ca campaigning for it because I sadly don't think it's sociologically realistic. Re I suspect there is going to be catastrophic war this century. I don't think it's going to wipe out life on earth or even the human species or anything like that. Um, but one of the few technical ways I know to uh, minimize the likelihood would be some kind of consensus in favor of all female governance uh, and yeah, some kind of yeah. uh, world. And I'm proud, proud to say that we predict that uh, the part of kind of medical science that I'm the leader of, the BAMF classification of transplant pathology, we predict that we're headed for female leadership there. We think that we'll have a female majority on the board and a female um, um, chief, uh, yeah, or chief, <laughs> chief desk. <laughs> that's our, that's our mm -hmm. prediction that the future of the Banff classification is female. Okay, um, one of you, there, please pose a question. Yeah. 
<clears throat> Hello. <laughs> Hi, Pram. Hi. Uh, Hi. Hopefully, hopefully you can hear me okay. Yes. Um, I was just wondering, what is the goal of transhumanism? Good heavens. Um, trans the transhumanist movement has many strands. Simplistically, I invoke the three supers. Super intelligence, super longevity, and super happiness. Uh, super intelligence, this is the idea that humans, rather than being the culmination of evolution, are, yes, stepping stones to something that is intellectually far superior. And full spectrum super intelligence will surpass us in unimaginable ways. What do we mean by full spectrum super intelligence? Some people imagine a future of machine super intelligence, others, a fusion of biological uh, humans and our machines, some kind of mind uploading. Others, and this is my own view, that full spectrum super intelligence will consist of AI augmented, genetically rewritten humans and our descend descendants, yeah, rewriting our own genetic source code and becoming, if one think of, thinks of the very smartest uh, humans, the von Neumanns and so on, imagining, yeah, essentially, uh, uh, full spectrum super intelligence. I mean, that's one goal. Um, super longevity. This is the idea that just as silicon robots could be repaired and replaced and upgraded indefinitely, in principle, there's no reason why sentient organic robots uh, can't be upgraded too. Uh, that's, yeah, transhumanists believe in phasing out the biology of aging where there's a stopgap cryonics or cryothanasia for oldsters who realistically aren't going to make it to the transition. But the third super of transhumanism, and this has been my primary focus, super happiness, the idea that it's going to be possible to use biotechnology to phase out uh, uh, the biology of suffering throughout the living world and replace the traditional pleasure pain axis with life-based entirely on gradients of intelligent bliss, i.e. transition to a more civilized signaling system. And it should be possible to do this not merely for humans, or a combination of pre-implantation genetic screening, counseling, CRISPR genome editing, but also the rest of the living world. Um, before we can go on to reprogram the global ecosystem and ambitious stuff like that, the first step really is going to be to end the horrors of animal agriculture, cruelty fee, cultured meat. But yeah, beyond that, the abolitionist project can extend to the rest of the living world uh, in ways, right, yeah, essentially a, a pan-species welfare state, everything from elephants to the humblest life forms, the insects, the crustaceans, the small rodents, they can be helped too by something like synthetic gene drives. So, yeah, back to your question then. As a, as a useful mnemonic, the three supers of, of transhumanism, super intelligence, super longevity, and super happiness, a triple S civilization. So, Pram, does that seem like a reasonable aim to you? Or, 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 or it, it is true that transhumanism is not as popular as, as one might like it's it's sort of getting it 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 bounces toward the main screen stream but it's nowhere near in it yet so i think that it, it's a somewhat controversial. something like yeah it's the what one might call transhumanist technologies are heading towards the mainstream, but they're just not under the banner of transhumanism. Indeed, some right. transhumanists aren't uh, comfortable with the label. Uh, this is why the World Transhumanist Association, which I founded, I founded with Nick, Nick Bostrom, decided to rebrand itself as Humanity Plus. So, yes, if and when uh, the uh, transhumanist project succeeds, it won't necessarily or even probably be under the banner of transhumanism. It'll, yeah, something else. Yeah. So other questions? So what about the rest of you? <laughs> Aha, yes. 
So <laughs> building on the idea of transhumanism and relating it to what you had mentioned earlier about the zombies not having the correct architectural makeup to mm. be considered, I suppose, intelligent. Or at what conscious. Point, yeah. Conscious, yes. Yeah. Um, at what point do at what point in the transhumanism process do humans evolve into those zombies? Because in, oh, in my yeah. opinion, by taking away <laughs> the suffering that makes humans human, we essentially become those zombies. Interesting. But would we say that the very happiest people who go through life animated by gradients of well-being are zombies or quasi-zombies? Probably not. I mean, there's the, there's the technical sense of zombie and there's the metaphorical sense. And by the technical sense of a zombie, I essentially mean that, that you haven't got a phenomenally bound subjective experience. That even if consciousness is fundamental to the world, which is a possibility I take seriously, that, yeah, if you replace the ones and zeros of a classical Turing machine uh, with discrete micro pixels of experience and execute the code. Uh, however fast you run the program, however complex the code, all you have still is a micro experiential zombie. Um, so that's one sense of zombie in the sense that you touch, touched on. I think very powerful intuition, uh, yeah, is that pleasure and pain are to a greater or lesser extent relative and inseparable from each other. Um, I would argue, though, and one can provide case studies to back this up, uh, that, uh, yeah, you can have a signaling system based entirely on gradients of intelligent bliss. And what's more, the very happiest people, their lives tend to be supercharged with a sense of meaning and purpose and significance. That if you look at people victims of depression their lives tend to be drained of meaning and, signif and significance, sense of emptiness, which shades in the case of severe depression to, to nihilism. And that by having this global shift, this hedonic uplift, recalibration of the hedonic treadmill, so that life for everyone is based on gradients of bliss, not merely will we be much happier, but our lives will be suffused with a much greater sense of meaning and, and purpose. One could say, yeah, super, super significance. Um, feel free to strongly disagree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can look at um, even the subject of would poetry die in such a world? I don't think so, you know, like in, in the poetry sessions that I, I was a part of here in Edmonton from 2014 on. So all of my poems were about uh, technology subjects or things from the course anyway. And uh, so there, there wasn't a lot of pain there. But yet they fit in with a, no. Nobody ever said, "Well, this is uh, unacceptable poetry because there's no nothing painful there." You know, so I, I don't think it would wreck anything if we just uh, had gradients of pleasure yeah. and didn't have pain. Scott, what do you think? Yeah, just to touch on that, that's that's a pretty interesting to think about because. I mean, when we when I think about, you know, some of my favorite musicians, artists, right, I, I feel like a lot of the, the beautiful work that they've made was because they've experienced such tragedy, trauma and pain in their life. Right. And yeah, if everyone was happy and had a greater sense of purpose, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, yeah, perhaps art and poetry or whatever, and maybe it won't die, but you're kind of you're still taking away that essential part of like the human experience of you know sadness pain and whatever and and at the same time like <clears throat> that manifests itself into beauty itself right like so yeah i don't know just just a thought 
Something like beauty, for example, that if we use neuroscanning, we can identify the molecular signature of aesthetic excellence of beauty and enrich and purify uh, uh, beauty. So, yeah, it will be possible to use biotechnology to enjoy a lifelong aesthetic excellence and beauty that potentially could be orders of magnitude richer than anything accessible accessible today. Um, in terms of uh, AI, I suspect digital zombies will be able to uh, uh, produce uh, essentially world-class music in the sense that they can outperform uh, humans at chess, many other games and many, many other co cognitive domains. Uh, other things being equal, it is surely best if we can produce works of great art and literature without all the trauma. Yeah. Um, no, it, it's sort of like the taste of meat without killing animals, right? We can teach hmm. AI to produce the best music of the type that used to require painful, traumatic human experiences but tell AI to do it without that, you know? <laughs> Start with the writing part. Don't, don't experience the pain and the trauma, but just give us the writing that used to come from that. And I, I think that would be possible, just like cultured meat would. It, it, it's similar. Yeah, so way. essentially we, 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 need to, we need to make this transition to a more civilized uh, signaling system. Uh, and just as, uh, yeah, silicon robots can do without the nasty raw feels of pain, but are still capable of the function of nociception, uh, essentially we want to make sure that uh, organic robots too can preserve the function of nociception and preserve the traditional role of some of our nastier emotions too, without the ghastly raw feels. Um, the yeah, precise you, balance of yeah. If, if if I mean one of the things that 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 has sort of struck me uh, in in my fifty plus years in medicine is how many psychiatrists feel about the success of psychiatry. Some of them almost break down and cry when they hear of a true cure or a complete resolution of psychiatric illness because that, that's so unusual in their own practice, you know? But you, you, you can imagine that could change, that we can find the cure to all psychiatric illness. And we still need instances of stuff like that, but you know, machines can do that for us. We, we can say, well, you know, we don't have schizophrenic people anymore, but we need to, to be reminded of what that was like. So give us a, you know, a schizophrenic poem or something, you know, and and I'm sure that they could do that. So we we won't necessarily lose any element of human experience, and even the part where you know there's a connection somehow between uh, vulnerability of your mental health and creativity, you know, that doesn't need to be the case in the future, but it, but it has been the case in the past. But now, you know, machines, like if you spend enough time with chat uh, GPT, one thing that happens is you become more creative because you learn about ideas that you would never have had yourself right and and, and mm -hmm. maybe even better than some of your best uh, ideas and that will only increase you know gpt4 will be even better at that than chat uh gpt is so yes i, I would look forward it yeah <laughs> yeah so I think we, we can keep everything that makes us human, but just not have to personally experience the suffering. I, I believe that's- Yes, I mean, if possible. one is pitching a message at a bioconservative audience, one stresses essentially how hedonic recalibration, shifting upwards your hedonic set point, 
doesn't entail giving up your existing values and preferences and personal relationships. It's just like waking up tomorrow morning in an extremely, extremely good mood, able, willing, take on the world and win to actually to implement all the things you wanted to do, do with your life. Uh, it's not buying into my version of paradise. Um, having said that, uh, yeah, it is immensely challenging still issues of mental health. One of the reasons why tackling mental illness is so difficult is that the neurotransmitter system most closely involved in hedonic tone is the opioid system. And as we know, there are all manner of challenges and problems with interventions targeted at the opioid system. Having said that, yeah, it is possible if we're prepared to have designer babies instead of the traditional genetic crapshoot, if we're prepared to make sure that our children have the best possible genetic default settings, even a few genetic tweaks can pretty much guarantee an extremely high quality of life for our, fu our future kids. Um, a handful of genes I particularly focus on, something like the SCN9A gene, the volume knob for pain, dozens of different alleles. It makes sense to choose a benign allele associated with extremely high pain tolerance that preserves functionality. Um, other examples, someone like Joe Cameron, this retired vegan Scottish school teacher, thought she was totally normal. It actually never gets anxious or depressed, incredibly high pain threshold. The reason it transpires is she has an almost unique dual mutation of her far and far out genes and far and far out regulate levels of anandamide for the Sanskrit, from the Sanskrit for bliss. So um, it, there's a temptation, particularly if one is chatting relatively informally like this, to gloss over the potential pitfalls. But I think as a civilization, we need to take some hard decisions. Do we want to conserve the biology of depression and pain and, and all the kind of horrors of ancestral Darwinian life? Or do we want to phase out experience below hedonic zero altogether? And if this all sounds too weird and transhumanist, I like to remind people of the constitution of the World Health Organization. All nations of the world are signed up to the WHO. WHO has a ridiculously less transhumanist than post-human conception of health. Complete physical, emotional, social well-being are set out in its, its founding constitution. And the only way to get anything close to health as defined by the WHO is genome reform. Uh, now, genome reform tends to uh, make a lot of people uncomfortable. The E word crops up. But yeah, if we are willing and we're now able to actually edit our genetic source code, we can create paradise, life based radiance on intelligent bliss. Maybe only post-humans will experience complete health as defined by the WHO, but life based on information sensitive, information sensitive gradients of well-being can still be sublime. And, and yeah, if there were if there were global consensus to implement the WHO conception of health worldwide, it could be done in a hundred years. Sadly, this isn't a prediction. I think Darwinian life has to extremely ugly surprises. In store, back in the hedonistic <laughs> imperative in 1995, I predicted the world's last experience below hedonic zero would be a, a few centuries from now in an obscure marine invertebrate. I haven't shifted, sadly, my timescales for the world's last unpleasant uh, experience. Um, but in terms of what's technically feasible, yeah, could be done in 100 years. Boldly, I would say that, yeah. So, Zayed and uh, Hannah, anything you wish to add to the conversation? It's pretty exciting to be talking about these big picture things. Yeah. Um, it can seem quite remote because here it is grandiose talk about the future of our forward light cone, life based on gradients of bliss. And tomorrow morning, you have to 
pay the bills and do the kind of the mundane. <laughs> Go back to regular life. life. But, yeah. Yeah. But revolutions think, happen. Yeah. Uh, um, I think yeah. for yeah, I think for me it's it's just kind of with with AI particularly, there's just so much like information. Uh, and kind of deciphering like what's valuable and what isn't has been a challenge, but it's, I think we're all in a very unique position because when we get to experience it through experts' eyes, through this class particularly, I think it's easier to almost conceptualize the good and the bad from it. So even in the case of like chat, chat GPT, I think from a student's perspective, it's like it can be very useful in that it can help me accomplish certain assignments and certain bits of homework with more ease than I might have before. Uh, and that might be helpful in the moment, but I also think in the long term, if I rely on ChatGPT more, my ability to learn and be analytical might diminish over time. And so AI might have, you know, that benefit in the short term, but in the long term, I don't think that I would benefit as a learner, uh, much less as a contributor to society moving forward. Uh, so. Yeah, it makes it a little bit tricky when we're thinking about the positives and negatives of chat GPT. Um, there's also been talk, especially in the field of education, of getting rid of, of essay writing altogether. That's been a hot topic because essays are designed to test a very specific mode of learning. And they definitely like have this <laughs> element of affluence and or wealth. So if you come from a very privileged society, typically you are good at writing essays. And if you don't come from that kind of privilege, essay writing can be very difficult. And so just weeding out essay writing altogether might lessen that inequality between certain learners. Uh, and so if we relied on ChatGPT to write essays, I think that would be interesting topic for research just because you would be able to still have that part of learning, but at the same time, it wouldn't be a differentiating factor between certain learners who might not have had the privilege of learning how to write a proper essay growing up. Um, so, yeah, that's sort of my very robust two cents on uh, <laughs> on yeah. what we've been talking about so far. But yeah, I just I just think I just like to think about how certain AI will benefit and or hinder me in the long term that's sort of where my brain goes when we have right. these sorts of discussions no i think you know patients are worried about physicians becoming uh de-skilled through ai that ai can assist us but possibly just as zayed says as we rely more and more on this smarter than human ai our, our intrinsic skills will maybe reduce more, more and more because we're not using them. We're, we're relying on the AI to do the stuff that we used to, to rely on our own. Uh, yeah. Well, I said, assuming you can have a, a neuro chip, it'd be you will be able to do everything that ChatGPT4 does and more. Right. But what can't... You know, here's, here's, here's an example that uh, I would like to be able to, instead of 10 million different shades of uh, color, people, tetrachromats, very rare tetrachromats can experience uh, an order of magnitude more more colors than uh, the, the neurotypicals. And the only way that it's going to be possible for you to have this vast expansion of your palette and know what it's like to experience these these new colors is to have somatic uh, gene therapy give you this extra cone so that it will be possible, yes, for you to experience color in the way that only a tiny handful of people can do today. And what is true of color is going to be true of the immense number of radically altered state spaces of consciousness as different as waking, dreaming, LSD consciousness. Um, we've touched on this in previous uh, uh, teaching sessions, but one of the good things or about phasing out the biology of suffering is that it will be possible to explore psychedelia, radically, radically alien state spaces of consciousness safely. I mean, one can't uh, today 
in spite of this psychedelic renaissance and talk of psychedelic therapy, I don't think one can responsibly advocate the use of psychedelics either for the purposes of intellectual exploration or therapeutically, that Darwinian minds are too dark and they are uh, unpredictable. But once we have invincible well-being, so yeah. someone is ringing me, yeah. so I'm afraid I, then, this, I, I'm going to get distracted, safe. but I hope, hopefully this, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, essentially, essentially, the safe exploration of billions of state spaces of consciousness. It's sometimes one hears talk of the, the end of science, the unity of science. What more is to, to be done? Yes, we've still got to get beyond the standard model in physics and so on. But it's easy to think that the enterprise of knowledge has, in a sense, uh, or if not come to an end, at least close to an end. Whereas I would argue that it is scarcely begun that we have yeah it's you know not even scarcely begun to explore these radically alien state spaces of consciousness it's the kind of thing that digital zombies chatbots classic classically parallel connectionist systems can't do because they're not capable of solving the binding problem so one thing perhaps i should mention is that uh, yeah yeah no, sorry, Kim. Yeah, I was just saying the binding problem, not though most people are familiar with the binding problem, uh, sorry, the hard problem of consciousness, i.e. why does subjective experience at all? If you say the binding problem, a lot of people will scratch their heads and ask to be reminded what the binding problem is. But it's absolutely critical because without binding, you don't have a mind. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we used to, the first time you taught here, you sent us an article about the bi the hard problem of consciousness and the binding problem. And I, I used to send that routinely to students, but I, I've not done that to these, <laughs> this particular group. So, yeah. But um, what what do you think about the pace of change right now? Do you think I'm wrong that there's something special about these 60 days? Or does it seem to you, David, like things are uh, progressing more quickly? Sam Altman is talking about 500 years progress in a single year in 2023. <laughs> do you think we'll see something like that? Uh, that's ridiculous. The so longest one does... So long as one doesn't confuse this with artificial general intelligence, because if it were the case, for example, that these systems were exhibiting a little bit of phenomenally bound consciousness, one could then extrapolate. But essentially, they are zombies. Uh, for architectural reasons, they are simply incapable of grasping the nature of what they lack. And right. if you're the yeah. kind of person who is interested in these topics of different state spaces of consciousness, different kinds of consciousness, you're going to be less impressed than if you're uh, a chess player or a doctor or a surgeon or a chemist or something like that. Yeah. yeah. I think what these computers can do practically is amazing, but they are not capable of feeling that, right? <laughs> they, they can't capture this you know amazing emotion that we feel looking at what they do they are incapable of feeling or understanding that or knowing why it is that what they're doing is so amazing but i yes, I, I, mean, I, I, I would say that yeah yeah it, critical to the notion of intelligence is the ability to distinguish the important from the trivial and because these computers do not have a pleasure pain axis, they have no notion of any. I think I may need to let is someone trying to get into the door. Uh, excuse okay. me, this isn't a. Is it? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm staying at someone's mansion. So. Uh, <laughs> well, you have to do what you have to do, you know. Is this, well, I think, do I need to let someone in? Yes. Hi. Sorry, I'm uh, again. Uh, mm -mm. So the Lord of the Manor has appeared, so I have to uh, write.
Sorry about this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, students, other questions, comments? Was this what you thought we would end up talking about today? <laughs> <laughs> there seemed to be a lot of possibilities of what we would end up talking about today. Um, if anyone is interested, I've got 45,000 words so far of GPT chat responses that we can send a, a, a link to. I've cherry picked the best, so it gives a rather misleading oh, cool. impression. Of, um, but on vaguely transhumanist, hedonistic, imperative related themes, uh, yeah, if anyone has any follow ups, uh, because we've covered a fair number of different topics, uh, yeah, feel free to drop me a line. But, right. uh, yeah. So, you know, I, I, I want to give a bit of history in the course that one of the first times that David Pierce spoke, I was impressed with the idea that what transhumanism needs, most of all, I felt, was the input of young people. Because at that time, every transhumanist I knew was sort of similar to my own age or even older God. God forbid. So I began uh, pushing the idea that students in the course would become active. But you know, it took seven years. <laughs> so Taryn Stokowski really did what I said. She, she mm -hmm. you know, uh, went head to head with the executive uh, director of uh, Humanity Plus, she as a young person became really a person to 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 uh, deal with, you know? Yeah, and, and, yeah. yeah. Crudely, and, we need young, young blood. And though it's yeah. uh, eventually one hopes in future, the notion of generations as we understand them will be superseded. But for now, yes, I won't claim that the older generation of transhumanists have played out. But yes, fresh <laughs> insights from young people, youth and dynamism. Um, perhaps I can announce that, uh, yeah, there is going to be a movie. We've got funding for yeah, a million, a million dollars uh, uh, for a movie on the hedonistic uh, imperative. It probably won't Excellent. be called that, but essentially yeah. the... Yeah, the biohappiness revolution, which will be yeah, exploring some of these uh, uh, themes that we've touched on in, in depth, the, you know, the, the, the abolitionist project, but hopefully in a more accessible way than anything I'm capable of. Um, so that's something to look forward to. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah. yeah. So uh, Pram has, has raised her hand. Yes. Yes, Pram. Okay, um, so my question is, in Buddhist philosophy, to eliminate suffering is to basically achieve enlightenment. So in the same way, is the transcending biology via transhumanism similar to reaching that state? Oh, good heavens. Um, what is enlightenment? Sometimes, I mean, Buddhism locates the origin of suffering in desire. And in many cases, I would say the extinction of desire is remarkably akin to what people experience when they mainline heroin. Now, of course, any uh, analogy between enlightenment taking heroin and Buddhism would be strongly resisted uh, uh, by most Buddhists and many other people. Um, although there are clear affinities between Buddhists and believers in the abolitionist project. I mean, after all, essentially, you could say that, yeah, using biotech to get rid of suffering, favor of gradients of bliss is, yeah, essentially it's Buddhism plus biotech. Um, one thing I would stress is that it's going to be possible to use biotech to amplify and enrich our desires. That whereas Buddhism, uh, yeah, focuses on the extinction of desire, which may or may not be associated with enlightenment. Uh, transhumanism will allow you to have a much richer, deeper uh, range of, of desires too. One shouldn't imagine, yeah, 
uh, yeah, some some kind of extinction of, of of desire. Though it's possible that the future does lie in blissful serenity. Someone who much prefers the idea of excitement and exhilaration and passion would be possible to enjoy that too. Mm -hmm. So I I think you and I have not talked about your thoughts about the ethics of pig to human transplants. That's actually what I'm talking to the students about on Thursday. What are your own thoughts about that? What where do uh, pigs fit in the ethical realm? What are our obligations to them? Well, uh, yeah. I think uh, uh, a transplant uh, is ethically permissible if you have a distressed pig and uh, a human <laughs> has a spare kidney that the pig ought to be able to benefit. <laughs> um, I'm saying this with, with a, a chuckle and inverting our normal priorities because sadly pigs are as sentient and demonstrably as sapient as pre-linguistic toddlers. I think they ought to be right. accorded exactly the same rights and love and care. Some people bridle at this and say, well, a pig doesn't have the potential to go on to be a mature human and, you know, produce art, literature, do calculus. But, yeah, rightly, we respect and care for kids with a progressive disorder who won't see their third birthday. Likewise, with, with, with pigs. Uh, and when it comes to anything involving non-human animal experimentation, I think the question to ask is, would this experiment be ethical if done on a human of co comparable sentience and sapience? Um. Yeah, so um, what I have said, I, I don't know if there's wisdom in this, it just seems practical, that we don't know that pig to human transplants are even going to work. I mean, we've, we've started to do human uh, trials to see if they will work, but we don't have the evidence yet. Until we even know that the procedure is going to work, certainly every objection to using pigs is um, should be given high priority. But once we know that this is like the best way of providing organs to everybody who needs them. And there's no alternative that is equally able to do that. Then somehow the ethics changes. It doesn't make it completely ethical, but it means that somehow you decide, well, I guess we can do it then, you know? So. Yes, within uh, the next decade or so, so whole body transplants should be possible. Um, and this, uh, the, the option there is to have a traditional organic body, but much better will be to have a, uh, an artificial cyborg, cyborg body. Uh, unlike many transhumanists, I think Phenomenal minds require a biological core in the in the form of neurons, but yeah, some form of cyborgization, uh, to use a rather barbarous term, is going to continue apace. And yes, I said one can look forward, at least if one is of relatively tender years, to uh, yeah, a, a cyborg body, a cyborg body, body uh, with much greater capacities than uh, organic bodies. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think every human sense can probably be improved on. There could be artificial eyes much better than our real eyes, and you know everything. Um, and and so one thought about where medicine is going is that in the future, maybe we will we'll have cured or prevented most illnesses we know today, but human enhancement, there is an unlimited wish, not only physical human enhancement, but moral, spiritual. You can imagine that if you offered everything that humans would never be satisfied they would always want more. Uh, 
Um, so that might be the main thing physicians do in future medicine is uh, enable and make decisions about human enhancement. <clears throat> it's not quite what a lot of doctors thought they were signing up for, but. No, I mean, well, this, this, you know, this shifting notion of what constitutes remediation and enhancement. And if, if anything is posed in the language of remediation, people will tend to be more accepting than if it's posed in the language of enhancement. And yeah. certainly anything we can do now, so-called enhancement by the standards of our more civilized successors will count as remediation. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think... That's right. So, okay. Um, so we have 17 minutes left in the period. Um, Want to make good use of that. So what other questions would you like to ask? Um, any other questions? Uh, if anyone can come up with uh, good prompts and coax good answers out of chat GPT, do send them my way because I'm currently compiling a list. I'm sure they'll they'll all seem very primitive in a few years' time. But uh, yeah, if I think of how long and painfully I must have a million plus, well over a million plus words online, but just the rapidity <laughs> with which GPTs churning out these answers uh right yeah i mean each each year i used to do perhaps a 15 or twenty thousand word essay on some particular topic and it would take you know a hard work you know several months work whereas just watching uh this software just churn out okay in some cases the response the answers are pretty mediocre but yeah it's still mind-blowing in spite of my seemingly derogatory comments about digital zombies and their limitations, it's still impressive. It is impressive, yeah. Yeah. Well, if, if you were a student today, if, if you were beginning your career and beginning learning, it, it seems to me um, there are questions that the student has that we never thought we would have to ask, you know? If, if there's something you can access that is better than you at doing what you're trying to do in every way, shouldn't you just ac access it? <laughs> Maybe just to learn from it, right? But on, on the other hand, what then becomes of your sense of self and so on with these constant reminders that you're not, you don't write as well as you should write, you don't draw as well, your big ideas are not big enough. <laughs> These ideas about how middle level you are and how machines are much better than you are, just be reinforced over and over every day it must be very hard for students. So what do you think? Am I getting this wrong? Or do some of you, you feel exactly like that? Or do you feel differently? Have I put your feelings, uh, have I characterized them wrong? What do you think? How are you reacting to chat GPT and what's going to come? I know yeah. a lot of academics seem to be very exercised by this issue of cheating. It doesn't really worry me at all uh, that, yeah, if someone, for example, can just have a have a neuro chip and speak, you know, all possible languages of the world, come up with encyclopedic knowledge uh, generating responses, does it matter if there is a particular cognitive phenomenology that goes with it? I mean, in the case of, you know, I'm churning out these sentences. Some of these sentences have never been <clears throat> expressed in, the in, in, in all of human history. Does it matter that I don't have introspective access to the syntax, you know, this language generating mechanism? I would say, no, what counts is the results. So yeah. even though 
in some ways, yeah, my focus is on consciousness and the nature of consciousness as a form of knowledge. In other ways, yeah, it it it, it doesn't matter for many purposes. Yeah. Yeah. What did you want to say? Uh, just a question really for you. So uh, as part of this class, uh, we have to write a research paper. And if I were to select a topic and you approve it, and then I don't write it, but I use chat GPT or some other program to write it and I submit it and it's better than anything I could write, what would your reaction be and how would that reflect on your grading of my paper? <laughs> so I think it's maybe easier for me running the course with the structure it's always had than it is for most people teaching. So let, let's talk about, first of all, the final presentation and the paper. They're, they have to be on the same subject, right? True. So suppose chat GPT does everything for you and you don't really make any effort to learn from what it seems to know that you don't know then you might give a really bad presentation and there would be this dissociation between the paper and the final presentation, right? On the other hand, giving that final presentation and answering questions about it, that's still going to be largely still you, right? And, and, and I think then working backward from the fact that the final presentation is, is mainly you, you would kind of want the paper to be mainly you too, because it just seems more valid, you know? And people say, well, did you take Kim Solis's course? And then you say, yeah, but chat GPT wrote everything for me and I did no work. And yeah, that, that would be a very good way to present yourself to your friends in, in future years and so on. So, and the same is true with the midterm, you know? I think as long as we do the midterm face-to-face -face with actually written answers, we, we, we can do it over a two-hour period. It's helped by the fact that quantum biology no longer is a separate part of the exam. It's just a few multiple choice questions. And Shana Panja's part of the, uh, the exam, which is where you can get some really valuable feedback from her, that's, that's probably where you should spend the most time in that two hour period. I think that'll work fine. And it's always sort of been up to you how much of the paper is is yours if it somehow fits with your presentation, you know. But I think in in the in the present climate, you'll probably want to be overt about it. Right? <laughs> well, we talk so much about Chat GPT, and this is what I did, you know. So so anyway, that that's. Kind of what I feel will will happen. You're, you you see you impress me as an honest group group of students learning about this the same as as I am, you know, and and so on. And what I've always promised is taking this course uh, makes you street smart for the future. You're more likely to survive whatever the future brings us than other students because probably whatever the future brings us, we've talked about. We have not necessarily identified it as more likely to happen than the other things we've talked about, but still you, you, you have that sort of survival edge. And at late night parties, when the others get quiet because they only know work stuff, you guys will really shine because all the experiences that this course has, has, you know, opened you up to. And I, I think that works better in a way if if, you're, if your mind is actually working on it, <laughs> you just borrow it from, from 
chat GPT, then your performance of those late night parties is going to be woefully wo deficient compared to the others who've actually thought about these things and, you know, done, done the writing and so on. Yeah. Anyway, I, as you know, I'm a fairly optimistic person. And that began on day two. My father was on call. He was a physician in training when I was born. Saw me the next day, comes into the nursery, and all these kids lined up in bassinets, and the rest of them are all crying and bawling, and I'm smiling and bopping. So I, I tend to have a more positive, optimistic view. But anyway, that's my long winded answer. Does that answer make sense to you? Yeah, it wasn't so much a serious question, just a curiosity, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah, because I think at some point that will be the case where students won't have to do the work, so. But don't maybe. you also think there are people who are the biological opposite of me? There are professors who lost interest in doing stuff professorial a long time ago and they're just looking at the clock every day and you know, wait until the bus comes where they can go back home because they really hate what they're doing and for them this this is really bad news because not only can't they tell whether chat gpt wrote your paper or not they really don't care right <laughs> anyway, that's the worst outcome where not only can't you tell, but you don't care. So yeah, that's that would be a sad state of affairs. Okay, so we've still got six minutes. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think. Scott? Uh, I'll yeah, I was talking to my friend about this topic as well, and uh, it, it, he bring up the topic of now they're making uh, programs and machines to actually detect if uh, essays or pieces of work are actually written um, from AI generated uh, programs. So I'm very curious to see where that goes because it's like the first AI war, if you will, you know, competing against each other. Um, I yeah, don't know. yeah but, just an interesting but... thought. Already people are crafting ways to work around such programs mm -hmm. and to have them activated by text that wasn't written by, <laughs> by chat GPT just to thoroughly confuse things. So that, yeah. And, and I'm sure those programs won't be perfect. You're, you're quite right. Uh, Sam Altman has talked about inserting some sort of invisible watermark so teachers can tell, but I, I, I'm sure that won't remain invisible to everybody. Someone will figure out what the watermark is and be able to modify it, and yeah. No, I think, um, doesn't it, if, if you st <laughs> want to spend these last, four minutes on something important, you know, when you don't have to do anything in your life because machines can do everything better, what will you do? What life, what is life for then? And so they're, you're starting to really decide that now, you know, like, like uh, how do I want to act? It, it's not how should I act to get a high grade or something? But how how do I want to think of myself in later years? You know, how did I cope with these new AI stresses of uh, 2023? What did I do? How did I react? I, I think that becomes more important probably than, you know, uh, the other superficial things one might, Think about, and then what kind of life would be satisfying for you in the foreseeable future? This course helps you to foresee the range of things that the future might maintain, might, uh, might contain, but what, 
would you like to see your future contain? And what would you like to see your role vis-a-vis -vis other humans and vis-a-vis -vis the planet and vis-a-vis -vis the universe? You know, where, where do you want to be situated? And does it matter? You know, does where you are situated matter? Or does it, is it inconsequential, right? So these, these are important, I think, things to think about. A little bit amusing, but also, you know, a, a, you, you can imagine, you know, professional thieves, other professional criminals, what will they do in that world? It's going to be tough. You know, maybe a lot of the type of criminal activity won't work anymore. And so you have to actually be legitimate and, you know, your skills at, at outwitting other humans won't have the same value they always had in the past. And what the heck is a good criminal going to do in the future? You know, you got to retrain for something ethical. God, I hate it when that happens, you know? Yeah. So. Yes, just on a, a concluding note, why should we be trying to develop, whether or not it, you call it artificial general intelligence, why develop artificial intelligence at all? Ultimately, I would say it matters only insofar as it impacts on sentient beings. Uh, yeah. And yeah. the nature of the negative feedback mechanisms of the hedonic treadmill means that unless we are prepared to tackle the biological genetic roots of suffering, not least, yeah, the, the hedonic treadmill. Late Mother Nature didn't design us to be happy. The, Mother Nature designed most of us, at any rate, to be extremely discontented and un unhappy a lot of the time because it was good for the inclusive fitness of our genes. If we're not using AI, biotechnology, actually to phase out the biology of suffering, to radically improve the lives of sentient beings ultimately it's just running harder and harder on the hedonic treadmill uh and so yes I, that remains my real focus uh fixing the problem of suffering and although ai can help us fix the problem of suffering something like alpha fold ultimately we're going to have to take decisions as a species are we going to conserve traditional Darwinian biology, Darwinian ecosystems, or are we going to rewrite our own genetic source code and, yeah, essentially uh, access post-Darwinian consciousness, um, life based on gradients of intelligent bliss? Okay, well, that's been a great teaching session, David, and, and, and we... Wish you a very pleasant remainder of your stay in uh, Buenos Aires and uh, look forward to the next time. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. And thanks to the students for taking part. Yeah. And on Thursday, we'll do pig to human transplants and the ethics thereof. So, so there. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay, I'll see you again. Bye, Kim. Bye. See you soon. Thank you for your students. Thank you. Chat again soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.